Futurized goes beneath the trends to track the underlying forces of disruption in tech, policy, business models, social dynamics, and the environment. I'm your host, Trun Arne Unheim, futurist and author. In episode 20 of the podcast, the topic is the future of engines. Our guest is Alec Skolnik, president and co-founder of Liquid Piston. We talk about engines and how they can power robots, vehicles, and drones. Our guest has made the bold choice of making a new engine, which hasn't been attempted since 1954, instead of just capitalizing on his gold-plated education in AI, robotics, and neuroscience in the most obvious way. Alex, how are you doing today? Doing well, Trond. It's, uh, yeah. Pleasure to be on the show today, and th- thank you for having me. Oh, sure. So, Alec, um, you are the CEO of Liquid Piston. You have a PhD uh, from CSAIL, the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT. And uh, you've done all kinds of interesting things in uh, in your career. You, you worked on robotics, neuroengineering, AI, Um and uh, that seems to be a pretty interesting combination these days. Uh, you're now, however, deep into good old engines. I find that kind of curious. And, and that's really why what this podcast is about. What is a guy who has educated himself on the three converging top trends in technology? What's he messing around with engines for? That's, that's, that's really my question. So um, let's just jump straight into it. All right, yeah. uh, Alec, um, uh, let's talk more about your background, but let's just jump into the mobility for a second. You're passionate about this. What is going on in that sector and why are you so passionate and, and especially about engines? Yeah, so there, there are a number of trends happening right now in the mobility space. Um, you know, the, the whole world is excited to be going electric. And I, I think that's a, uh, it's a historical trend. The world has wanted to go electric since the beginning, but um, you know, what we see is a, a move towards electrification and also exciting new spaces like urban air mobility, just uh, completely new concepts in mobility. So, um, you know, the, the, these things are, are pretty exciting right now. And how, would you say you got there and, and what would, you know, out of all of the things that you've done to, to get to this question, which we'll discuss at, at length, you know, what, you know, whether the future is all electric and what, what, what engines have to do with all this, right. but you've had a pretty interesting path from, from Emory, Georgia Tech, Emory, MIT. How did, how did I get what here? Are, right? <laughs> how did you get here? What, what is like, you know, from all of these experiences, what, what would you say drove the direction and how did you get to engines? So I've always had a passion uh, for math. I, I like uh, I kind of view the world in, in a mathematical framework. Um, MATLAB is one of my all-time favorite things to just play with, if you will. Um, you know, and you might ask, what are the commonalities between neurons and robots and engines? And I will tell you that you can code all of them in in math and and just kind of view the world as a as a big modeling and optimization problem. So. Um, but the, the first element for me personally, and the thing that draws it all together is, is the math and, and the modeling uh, aspect. But aside from that, I, I've always just been um, intrigued by tough, challenging problems. Um, you know, I, I like big problems. Uh, artificial intelligence is a big problem. Um, and, and frankly, so, so is power and energy, right? It's a really fundamental uh, problem that that um, is worth addressing, and I'm I'm personally drawn to that. Uh, the other component here is I, I I'm doing this with my father, so my my dad is a physicist, um, and you know for us thermodynamics has been a topic of conversation around the the, the breakfast table since I was you know a, a little kid, right? I just kind of grew up in that environment, and so. Um, my dad's a physicist. He thinks about things like, why does your car only convert about 17% of the energy and fuel into useful mechanical work, right? And we'd have in-depth conversations about that um, <laughs> for, for, for a very long time. So um, he, he kind of takes it from the physics angle. I, I take it from the math and, and optimization angle. And, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a good satisfying problem to to solve so that's that's why i'm here and i I think we have um some really good 
solutions on here and maybe a different perspective than what, than what people are, uh, are thinking. Can I ask you another question about that? I find it so fascinating how you're working with your, your, your father and how he's been inspiring to you over so long. I mean, I have a similar experience, uh, you know, in my childhood, I would say I was very inspired by the conversations, uh, with my father and then later working with him. And I was like a guinea pig in his cognitive psychology lab from, I was, 10. And, yep. and then, you know, as I grew up, I, I became kind of a research assistant. And it's it's really a fascinating uh, way to grow up. I think I'm sure everybody grows up in a different way. It, 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 you know, this kind of fascination with science in various degrees, it, it really shapes you as a as a person and the Definitely. attitude to to what you care about. But and we'll talk about this after after a while, but you took it far, you took it from the breakfast table to actually you know, uh, doing a business with your father. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, but uh, does that mean that you never had an uproar as a 16 year old or ha- have you always been that close? I find that very fascinating. <laughs> um, you know, my father and I, we've always been close. Um, you know, I, we've definitely had our share of disagreements and parental child issues. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's normal, <laughs> yeah. but, um, being able to work with him over many years on, such a challenging problem. You know, we, we work very closely together. Um, you, you can't agree on everything. And what we just do is we sort of just talk things through. And um, even sometimes if we have to agree to disagree, we, you know, we at least we talked about it and agreed to disagree. Um, so it's it, it adds a different dynamic to it. But it's also, you know, I, I couldn't imagine a better partner to launch this business with uh, the, the partnership that we have is extremely strong and we just kind of get through anything here. Um, you know, it's, it's not an easy endeavor to start a new, uh, company that is going to build an engine, right? We're, we're competing with something that's 150 years old, uh, playing catch up with this, you know, and, and we're, we're competing against giants that, that have hundreds of engineers, uh, uh developing piston engines that, uh, you know, we're going head to head with that, with our group of, you know, 15 or 20 guys. So, um, it, it's full of its challenges and, uh, yeah, he, he's a great partner to work with. And it's been, it's been a pleasure to, to be able to, you know, to do that with him. I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad there's something in the programming circles, which I'm sure you're aware of called extreme programming. And the idea, right. Is that you're working in teams of, of two, usually physically co-located and just get an enormous amount of work done because you're kind of just power team. And it sounds like yeah. you guys are this power team before we get to the future of engines. One of the things we talked about briefly when uh, preparing this is, uh, the you you mentioned a formula miles per gallon uh, and then energy equals power uh, times time. What do we need to know about this equation and then make it relevant for uh, my listeners in terms of the challenge facing mobility? And then we'll we'll go into why engines actually is a as a part of the answer to this question. Yeah, uh, I think it's worth kind of just uh, b- b- backing up a little bit and and uh, looking at the idea of electrification uh in general for uh for vehicles um yeah. so you know the, the issue is not so much the with electrification right that's a great idea and i'm an engine guy but i'm i'm fully supportive of electric propulsion there's a number of advantages in electrification uh for a car the the big one is that you get regenerative braking so what that means is you put a lot of energy into accelerating your vehicle. Uh, if you have a, a, a purely engine-driven car and you hit the brakes, you're taking all that energy in your vehicle and, and you're, you're putting it out as heat. That's the function of your brakes is to convert your kinetic energy into heat. Uh, yep. with, with an electrical propulsion system, you, you change the game. Instead of uh, dissipating everything as heat, you're taking that kinetic energy, and when, when you apply the brakes, you're, you're trying to put that energy back into the batteries. So from a systems efficiency perspective, you know that, that, that's a great thing. Um, the, the problem is not so much on the electrical side, and, and we can talk about this for an urban air mobility perspective as well, where yeah. you know electrification is a game changer for small aircraft. And the reason for that is, you know, you, you, you might ask, how is an urban air mobility vehicle different than a helicopter? And the, the real answer is 
instead of having a giant blade, which is extremely noisy, you, you can you can distribute your propulsion over a large number of small uh, propellers and dramatically reduce the noise, which actually makes uh, something like a like a flying uh, vehicle attractive in a city environment. So that that's great. That's enabled by electrification. The the problem in both of these environments is the battery. It's not the electric propulsion part. It's the right. energy storage part. And if you look at um, how much energy can our batteries store, you know you have to you have to look at the cell level, and then you have to look at the the battery level. Uh, your best batteries today, the the ones from Tesla, they they get about 150 uh, watt hours per kilogram. Okay, 150 watt hours per kilogram. You compare that to fuel, which has 12,500 watt hours per kilogram. Now you, you can't convert with 100 percent efficiency from fuel into into energy, but even if you account for efficiency of an engine and a generator, it's a 30 to 40 x delta in energy density between batteries and fuel. So that that's an incredible delta. I agree with the delta, Alec. But isn't the isn't the argument everyone's making is that there's an unfair comparison because there's never been economics of scale in the battery market. And the moment those things are evened out, the innovation path of batteries is going to start, maybe not resembling Moore's, Moore's law, but it's going to, you know, the, the, the path of progress, which admittedly has been quite slow in, in, in battery technology, when it comes from an, an efficiency perspective, like, like you just pointed out, that those would even out with economies of scale. Is that not the case? Well, I think honestly, we, we are at a point of, of already being there for that. I think batteries are improving at a remarkable rate. Um, I, I think if batteries improve by twofold over the next decade, I think that will be remarkable. Uh, but you're still going to have a 15 to 20 X delta between batteries and uh, fuel. <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's a very large gap to cross between batteries and uh, and, and uh, fuel, and and there there are different kinds of uh, fuel that that enabled you also to to, to kind of play a, a different game with the CO two uh, Im- impact of, of that. Uh, but that, so that's let's the other, go. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say that that's the other thing that's often just simply neglected here. Um, that, that is the the overall. If if you look holistically at electric uh, vehicles and, and and take it from well to wheel take it if you, you have to look at the production of the battery uh, you, you have uh, raw materials that you have to produce it takes a lot of water to do that it takes a lot of energy to do that there was a, a study that came out uh, that showed in it, this was a, a German study but it showed that it takes about 12 years for a electric car to catch up with a clean diesel car in terms of CO2 footprint. So everybody knows that an electric car runs clean. The government will tell you it's a zero emission vehicle. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But yeah. what you neglect is you're carrying a, a 12 or 1500 pound battery in your car. You have to carry that around with you everywhere you go. You have to produce that thing. You have to ship that across the, the, the ocean a couple times, just in the, in the, in the manufacturing of, of your typical vehicle. Uh, it, it's a lot of energy to produce and uh, and then you have to think about the the recycling Im- impact you know what what happens uh, in in the full life cycle of the battery and and there, there's quite a bit to to think about there and, and lastly we, we come to uh, miles per gallon equivalent the the MPGE so right. the governments are kind of pushing electric uh, electrification and, and showing hey this car is cleaner than your your fossil fuel car right this, this has 80 80 miles per gallon um uh, of uh, equivalent uh, electrical whereas your your car is only 30 right that that's a huge difference and and people see that on, on the sticker on the car and say hey my, my electric car is cleaner and not only that it's a zero emission vehicle um now what they've done is they only consider the electrons from the battery being used to power your vehicle. That's right. how they compute the mile per gallon equivalent. And that's what gives them the right to say that it's a zero emission vehicle. The reality is we don't produce most of our energy with, uh, w- w- you know, w- with purely renewable sources. It's not like you're constantly hooking up your Tesla to a solar battery panel 
to, to charge your battery. The, the truth is you plug into the grid and most of our energy still comes from uh, fossil fuel uh, sources on the grid. So w- when you look at that, what we've done is we've transferred the, the carbon. It, 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 it's not a zero emission, sorry, it's a zero emission vehicle, but you've moved the emission to the, the power generation source, right? So that, there, there's Got a number it. of these challenges here. Got it. So that brings us to why it's relevant to uh, deal with engines. But And you are among those rare engineers who have invented a new engine. I must say, when I heard that the first time and I talked to some people about that, they said, well, that's, that, that's crazy, right? Because the last big innovation, arguably, came from Rudolf Diesel in the 1890s, right? That was the diesel engine. And tell us then about the process that you went through, but, but, more, but let's peel back the onion, uh, onion a little bit on, on kind of engine technology. Because like, like you pointed out, Liquid Piston, your, your startup, seeks to disrupt the 400 billion internal combustion engine market. And that market has been basically created in the 1880s with, uh, you know, Gottlieb Daimler and Carl Benz. I, I believe it was 1886 when they invented the engine that you're competing with, uh, which was the four-stroke gasoline engine. So now just give us a little primer in, in diesel engine, rotary engine, which is your solution, and piston engine. What are these engines? When did they all come on the market? And by the way, electric engines as, as, as well and hybrid engines. So let's add those to the mix. What are all these different engines? What are the principles? I understand that some of them have coexisted and come back and in and out of the market. And I know Mazda, a company that I, I've driven cars for sports cars from, from Mazda. They are, you know, they were big on rotary engines. So we'll, we'll talk more about Mazda in a second, but give us just a primer on this engine situation. It's, it's complicated, but you know, hopefully for the general person, what, what can you tell us in, in, in a few minutes? <laughs> So you, you just raised uh, so many issues there. I don't even know where to start. Exactly. But, um, it, it's, uh, it's amazing to look back at the history of all of these developments. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about electrification and a lot of people don't know this, but um, I, I think the earliest uh, cars on the market, commercially available vehicles, were actually uh, fully electric. And it, right. it, it, it wasn't until they coupled the engine with an electric motor, right? Uh, when you had a starter motor that starts exactly. your main engine. Exactly. That's when all of a sudden the engine took off and that's when all of a sudden the, the, the car actually could displace a horse. And, 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 and that was the, the start of uh, mobility as, as we kind of know it today. It, it was that hyb- hybridification. Um, so just a I fascinating- found that it's a fascinating fact, right? Because it could be applicable to so many technologies, if you think about it. And, and it's applicable to explaining uh, the lack of traction that early stage anything has okay. before it gains momentum, because you may be building on or needing that last little building block that may not even be within your scope. It's something from a completely different area. And once you plug that in, now yeah. you've got something. That, that, that's so, exactly but, but, that's exactly right. And and, and you know we're, we're kind of going full circle on that. We, we we think that the right solution in the end w- will be a, a hybrid, you know, compact, e- efficient generator coupled with a electric propulsion system and a small battery. So we, we we think the right solution also marries marries the two. But coming back to your question on on some of the history here, uh, you know, the 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 combustion engine as we know it was invented about 150 years ago. Um, you know, a famous quote, uh, uh, if you want to invent something new, I'll open a history book. <laughs> we we <laughs> tell people that we've invented a brand new kind of rotary engine. Uh, we, we call it the X engine. And it's, uh, we, we say that it's very different than a Weinkel engine. Uh, but the fact is that Felix Weinkel in the 1960s uh, he he analyzed a large number of different types of rotary compressors and pumps and rotary machines. Uh, he actually published a book and he went through all these different types of rotary machines and he, he went through a process of selecting how do I take this rotary machine and make it into a, a four-stroke combustion engine. And he said, okay, first of all, you have to seal the thing. If you can't seal your your cavity, 
you, you're, you're trying to generate pressure with your engine. That, that's the main thing your engine is doing is, is generating pressure and then converting that pressure. Yeah, so just give me a quick visual image of this. So in a, in a regular engine, I mean, it's a dumb question because they're, you know, they're, they're all coexisting at this point. But yeah. the combustion chamber, you know, the, it goes up and down. It creates this pressure, yeah. but it's not a closed compartment. In yeah, the so, same so way that your you, model is. You, you look at a piston engine. Let's just start with a piston engine. You, yep. you, you take your piston. It, uh, it, it moves back and forth. The volume inside shrinks and grows. So the, the, the two important features here are the volume, which is shrinking and growing, and then the pressure inside of the cavity, inside your chamber. As, as you compress the gas, the pressure goes up. Then you will uh, add heat. You, you, you want to build more pressure, so you're going to add heat. We do that by combusting fuel, uh, and th th that's where the difference comes in between gasoline and, and diesel engines. Uh, the, the gas engine operates on a auto cycle, which means you have air and fuel in the, in the cylinder to begin with. You compress the mixture, including the fuel, and then you spark it. So, so that's yep. how you add your heat. And then you expand. When you expand, you have this high-pressure gas acting on your piston, and it's yep. that expansion process that actually translates into useful mechanical work. With the diesel, uh, rather than uh, compressing air and fuel together, you know what that does is that that limits your compression ratio. And the thermodynamics tell you that you want to increase the, the compression ratio. That the higher you can compress, the more pressure you get, the more thermally advantageous everything is. Uh, gas engines are limited because if you compress too much, the mixture explodes. So what the diesel did, they, they uh, they, they compress air with no fuel. And once you're fully compressed, you add fuel. And because it's so hot inside with the compression, it spontaneously self ignites. It's called compression ignition. And, and that allows you to drive the engine to much higher pressures, much higher temperatures, and overall much higher uh, thermal efficiencies. So, so please continue this process. But as I insert that my son, who's 11, is fascinated by cars and engines and the bigger and the faster, the better. <laughs> Just in terms of how these cars become so super fast, I've understood that actually a lot of supercars these days are exploiting those same principles and they are combining electric and and piston uh, engines, but but I even if you just consider piston engines, what what is so different about an engine that runs in a normal car, let's say my car, and a sports engine, like a sports car's engine? What what is it? That, is it just the size and so, so that it, it capable of more pressure? The really cool thing about engines, uh, no, no matter how you've tried to replace them over the, over 150 years, people have tried pretty much everything they could to try to kill the engine, right? Yep. We, we, we've had fuel cells, we've had, you know, super capacity, we, just so many different things have tried to kill the engine. But no matter what we've tried, uh, people have been able to innovate on the engine and, and make improvements to them. And they, they are remarkably flexible. They're relatively inexpensive to produce. You know, you, you compare it to a turbine, it's an order of magnitude uh, cheaper than a turbine to, to produce. Um, it, it's just incredible what, what people have done with engines. So the, the big thing that's happened in engines in, in the last uh, couple of decades is uh, uh, boost. Basically, you, you add a supercharger, almost a small turbine that will uh, push a lot more air into the engine. And when you, when you push more air into the engine, you, you, get, you can add more fuel, you get more power. So that, that's a big thing that, that's, that's happened um, engines have just become more, more efficient o over time. You know, people have really optimized every last drop that they could using these conventional cycles, right? Got it. And, and, and the cycle has not changed since the, the 1800s, but people have gotten closer and closer to that optimal cycle. Uh, what, what we've done is kind of just started with a whole new cycle. So we, we we're taking it for, from a completely different look. But um, yeah, th uh, th 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 there's a lot so of different So give me a sense, give me a quick overview of the rotary engine. Uh, yep. I guess number one, Felix Wankel's 1954 engine. Yep. What is it that he did? So yep. from what I understand as a layman, like you said, he created a different chamber and there's a, there's a different shape of the part. It looks like a 
Dorito, for lack of better words, the inside <laughs> it's a triangular part. rotor. Yes, so, exactly. Uh, you, you're correct. So, so um, as I was kind of mentioning earlier, we, he looked at a bunch of different compressors and pumps, rotary machines, um, and, and he he went through how do you seal a cavity because sealing is everything in, in in the engine. The reason the piston engine is so hard to displace, it's a piston which is basically a circle. And a circle is very easy to seal. You have a piston ring and you're sealed. That's right. the reason the piston engine has been so hard to displace is because it, it has really good sealing and sealing is everything in the engine. Now, the rotary, Felix Weinkel went and surveyed all these different types of new types of uh, rotary machines. And he was looking for two things. How do you seal it? And how do you get the air in and out so that it can actually behave like a four-stroke uh, machine, how, how, you know, how, how do you do that? And yeah. he converged on what we call the Weinkel engine, uh, the rotary engine as we know it today. And, and you're right; it's very different than a piston engine. It doesn't have oscillating uh, pistons that move back and forth. Instead, it has this uh, triangular rotor, the the Dorito chip, as you call it, <laughs> and yes. it, it, ins- it, it rotates inside of a peanut shaped housing. It's a tro- tro- but there's out. an additional element, and, and again, I, I will con, uh, you know I will confess I am no mechanical engineer. But there's an additional en- element on that Dorito. There's a little cavity on the Dorito. The, or the, the moving part has a or, or the, around the moving part there's a cavity. What is the function of that cavity um, in so terms the, of generating the kind of pressure we're talking about? In the Weinkel engine, the the entire uh, chamber is moving. Right, the, the, the whole yep. thing is spinning, yep. and uh, the way that they get combustion in the rotary in, in the Weinkel rotary engine is by having a combustion chamber. So they have they have a carve out inside of the rotor, yep. and that that's where the the uh, air and fuel can can uh, burn. Uh, so so it's a it's a moving uh, combustion chamber, and uh, that, that's one. And of the, the reason things. why it's so efficient is that the triangular shape. Because from I, I was watching a video, uh, 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 you know, on this just to try to really understand what's going on. But because of the triangular shape, there's something about you get like three chances to increase the pressure because every time it turns, it spins onto three angles. Is that what explains what you're going to tell me? Which is that it is just such an efficient type of engine is that the, what is the secret why is it why is that particular shape so efficient so i, I wouldn't say that the weinkel engine is efficient I, I would say that it's extremely power dense it's uh, okay uh, so that's maybe the difference. you, you yeah. would say that it's efficient in its implementation but you, you, you look at the equivalence between a rotary engine and, and you're 100 percent correct the rotary engine has three working uh chambers so yeah. a, a triangle forms three areas where uh, you, you get intake, combustion, and expansion in three parts of the engine. So but it's the size that is so efficient, you're yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about it. You, you've, got, you've got two moving parts, a rotor and a shaft. There's yeah. no valves. There's no valve train. You've eliminated yeah. dozens of components, and functionally, you behave just like a three-cylinder, four-stroke gasoline engine. So th- okay. they've just taken the, this massive you know, uh, engine that, that has a lot of parts and reduced it to something very small, compact, no oscillating mass, which means much less vibration. It's extremely smooth. So th- those are all the known benefits of the Weinkel engine. And that's the reason why Mazda was obsessed with it and continues to be obsessed with it. Little known fact, Mazda has uh, stopped and restarted production of the rotary five times in its history. And they are still patenting new rotary technology that they are, um, uh, they're, they're actively working on on rotary engine technology, and um, kind of. But a tell me how how so then? Okay, fine. So Mazda, but a number of other companies: Daimler Benz, obviously, Alfa Romeo, Rolls Royce, Porsche, Porsche, General Motors, Suzuki, and Toyota. All of them in the nineteen seventies. In the seventies, sixties, and seventies, were experimenting and to some extent actually issued cars. With these yes. engines, yes. Then a couple of things happened, and what would you say? I mean, the oil crisis of seventy three. The oil crisis was huge. So, so the Weinkel engine, uh, f- it, it has the benefits: the power to weight, the very smooth operation. So it's it's great for a sports car. However, uh, it's always had its challenges, and the the, the main challenge is the seals. So uh, on each corner of the triangle in the rotor, you you have to seal the corners there. It's extremely hard to do that. Uh, engines are hot, so they, they kind of thermally expand and shrink. You, you have to leave gaps. And when you're trying to seal sharp corners, 
they, they never really manage to solve that problem. So uh, they, they get worse ceiling than a piston engine. And uh, again, I, I told you ceiling is everything for an engine. If you have worse ceiling, you have worse efficiency. The other thing is they have that uh, long, skinny combustion chamber, right? It, the, the surface yep. of the triangle is their combustion chamber. Combustion grows like a ball. Imagine trying to grow a ball inside of a long, skinny corridor. You can't do it. Okay. So what, what they do is they'll put multiple spark plugs trying to get multiple balls of combustion uh, growing in the chamber, but they end up with incomplete combustion. All, all of the early rotaries, they, they actually had a post combustor. They would literally take the exhaust coming out of the engine and light it on fire again because so much fuel was coming out of the engine uh, uh, completely unburned. So, well, so that's, I guess, one of the other problems, right? So the California low emission standards, and there's at least three rounds of these standards in the 90s, 91, 96, 99. Uh, the perception was, at least among policymakers, that there were fuel economy disadvantages connected with this engine. So it's not just the story of the technology per se, but it is, it's also, it got labeled in a certain way, right? That it had a high emission downside. It, it had two problems. It well, three problems. Number one, the efficiency, and that translates into poor fuel economy. So the, 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 the buyer of a car sees a low MPG rating on the car and, and uh, it's more expensive to operate. Number right. two is emissions. And, uh, and the third is durability. Weichel engines were, were known to be a little bit unreliable. The, the seals, uh, they move at a high speed and they can wear out. And the, the problem uh, for the emissions is related to the incomplete combustion, number one, but, but also in terms of how do you lubricate the seals? Uh, you, you, these are sliding metal components. They must be lubricated. You know, you, you need oil in every engine. Uh, and in the Weinkel, they get very poor lubrication because you have to get oil to the seals. They're moving at a high speed. You can't lubricate them well. So what they end up doing is dumping oil into the intake. Now, now you're trying to burn oil. That's what the yeah. Weinkel engine does. And, and you know, a lot of times you'll have to pull over on, on, on the road and, and just literally add a quart of oil you know, <laughs> while, while driving somewhere because they, they burn so much oil and all That's that nuts. oil ends up as emissions out the exhaust. So all of these challenges, uh, these are, this is what prevented the rotary from really taking off. You know, M Mazda did its best to advance it. And in the RX-8 in, in 2012, they, they, they finally pulled the plug on it because they, they could switch oil types and they could either meet emissions or they could meet durability, but they, they, they couldn't meet both at the same time. Um, so they, they have but to notwithstanding, like you said, Mazda now arguably wants to use a rotary engine as a range extender in a kind of a hybrid vehicle scenario. Yep. Isn't that right? It, it, exactly. And when you can optimize the rotary for a single operating point, you know, may, maybe they can do things to help. And, and, and over the years that they are, they are advancing it. What is the sky active X engine that they have developing, uh, developed? Have you, have you seen a, a prototype of that? I saw it online. Some guy had it printed out. Uh, so I, I've seen probably what you know what what you've seen, but Mazda has been working on a number of uh, efficiency improvements. They have the Sky Active uh, G, which is the gasoline efficiency and, uh, program. They have the same for the diesel engine, and then they have the the X uh, program. Uh, but they're, they're trying to make improvements where they can uh, to the rotary. Um, you know, Mazda is a funny animal because it's it's one of the few companies as a startup we 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 try to talk to everybody that that'll listen to us and, and Mazda is the only company that we've never been able to have a single conversation with and we have <laughs> connections at every level we, we, I I know somebody that knows you know executives I know somebody that knows their engineers I, I know somebody that knows their middle level management the response that comes back to us is extremely consistent they say Alec you know, your engine's nice, but it's not a Weinkel engine. You have a, a new rotary engine. It's not a Weinkel. Our mission in, in life is to do the, the Weinkel rotary engine and to bring that to its full uh, fruition. So we, we can't even talk to Mazda and, and you know. <laughs> That's so fascinating because I would have I would have thought that that was a great conversation.
Struggling to crack the code on innovation? Don't look too hard. Buy the book. Disruption Games How to Thrive on Serial Failure by Trond Unheim was published by Atmosphere Press in 2020. Common Wisdom says that success breeds success. However, what if only repeated failure does? The author has followed thousands of founders and startups at MIT and beyond as they struggle, pivot, fail, or succeed. The secret? Training as if for the Olympics with the top mentors, being in the right places, and and deeply examining what you learn along the way. The biosphere of innovation cannot be a template between R&D, innovation labs, partnerships, startup scouting, corporate venturing, accelerators, or open innovation. You never know where the breakthrough starts. Thriving on failure is the way of science. In four moves, get exposed to disruption, take or simulate risk, persist until point of failure, reflect and recover. Buy the book anywhere books are sold and learn more at disruptiongames.com. Let's now move then to your engine. So it is a rotary engine, but it is different. What it's, is the difference? It's different. And there's two fundamental differences. So the first and the most foundational difference is we really went back to the thermodynamics of how engines operate, right? This is something that hasn't changed in 150 years uh, since, since the days of, of, of Rudolf Diesel, as you mentioned. Um, you know, we went back and just looked at a physics perspective. Why is your car engine converting 20% of the energy into useful work? Why can't we do better than that? And the, the answer can be found in the physics. Uh, so what we want to do is have a high compression, just like a diesel. But then you want to actually have a very complete combustion process. You want to give the engine time to burn fully. And the automotive world is doing something called HCCI, homogenous charge compression ignition. Basically, what that means is they compress and have a controlled explosion uh, and have a very rapid combustion process. The reason they're doing that is to get that constant volume combustion piece. Our approach is different. We, we want to give the engine time to actually burn all the fuel completely, and that's thermodynamically better. The third component is once we compress, combust, and expand, there's a lot of gas pressure left over, right? If, if you've ever heard a car that has a leak in the exhaust, it's yep. extremely noisy. You're hearing the energy that's left over in the exhaust. In an ideal world, what we want to do is continue expanding to a larger ratio compared to our compression ratio. So this is a new cycle. We're, we're talking about optimizing the cycle and kind of cherry picking features of, of other cycles that are out there. And, and we call it the high efficiency hybrid cycle. Uh, so that, that that's, that's innovation number one. And that's foundational for us. We get about 30% more efficiency than a traditional uh, piston engine ever could just by the cycle advantage. Just quickly, the reason you can be so open about this is you have patented this. Is that why? Because you're being very descriptive about something that in many markets it would be a, a trade secret but but you're being explicit about the the nature of this because you've protected it or or because that doesn't really matter no one could build this we well a couple things there we, we have 64 patents on the technology right. now either issued or pending so over 40 of them have issued and the the thermodynamic cycle itself that i just mentioned we have a method claim so it doesn't matter what the engine looks like we we kind of own that uh the, the cycle from an intellectual property perspective uh, yeah that, that's a great question perfect uh, but the 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 rotary engine you know coming back to to our uh our technology here so right. the fir the first part is the thermodynamics the second part is how do you implement that new cycle and We've spent a long time doing this. We, we started the company back when I was a, a first-year MIT PhD student. We, we started the company in, in 2003 with the idea uh, of a liquid piston, and that's why the name of the company. We had uh, a, a body of fluid, and the gas would act on the fluid. There was literally no metal moving parts in, inside the engine. People told us we were crazy. It would never work. There's no way. <laughs> we, we learned later that it's actually used, uh, something similar is used. It's called a Humphrey pump in the fishing industry that they, they use it to process, uh, fish. But anyways, uh, it, it, we also had a learning process here. 
we, we looked at dozens of different types of engines. We, we, we tried our best to do it with piston engines. We tried with various types of rotary engines. And yeah. it, it, was a, it was a long learning curve to converge on the X engine. And, and so that's the second piece here is a brand new kind of engine architecture. And the simplest way to think about it is we took the old Weinkel rotary with the Dorito, uh, you know, rotor and the, the, the peanut housing, we turned it inside out. So everything is the exact opposite. Take everything you know about the Weinkel and, and turn it inside out. Instead of having a three-sided rotor and a, a two-lobed housing, we have a two-lobed rotor in a three-sided housing. Instead of having moving apex seals that are very challenging to seal, we have stationary apex seals. The, the seals move to the housing. Now they're stationary. We get a uh, much better uh, uh, sealing. They're easy to lubricate. You can directly supply tiny amounts of oil right to the sealing surface. So we, we've just solved two of the three core challenges of the Weinkel. And then uh, we, we mentioned the long, skinny, moving combustion chamber of the Weinkel. Well, our combustion chamber moves to the housing. Now you can make it round. You can make it small. You can uh, do direct injection. And what that means is we can have a high compression ratio, like a diesel, and, and consistent with our cycle. And we can inject uh, fuel, which is necessary for a diesel operation. So mm. we, we are uniquely capable of running a high-efficiency diesel cycle while solving all of the inherent challenges of the old rotary. Alec, let's go back a moment to what, something you just said. They thought we were crazy. <laughs> we're in a moment we'll talk about how you have clients and how this thing is actually built and how you know there, there's a, a a good end to this story or at least there is a, there's some promise to this story which you know without which this would be very sad but tell me what were you <laughs> thinking what was your dad thinking when when people are saying liquid piston i mean you guys are nuts i understand you're smart but please just this has been done we know the mazda story a rotary engine we know the history of it i'm sure very smart people very powerful people dismisses your idea at that stage based on some rudimentary understanding of market dynamics, some history of the automotive industry, a little bit of prejudice here and there. And, and also the thought maybe uh, that crossed my mind is, you know, yes, they're smart, but who, who are they to think that they are going to be the next thing after uh, Benz and diesel? So, so tell me what you were feeling when all of these things must have been, come to a four, you were, I don't know, raising your rounds, you were do, making your rounds, certainly, in all these engineering circles and commercial circles. And what you hear is, guys, you're crazy. What does that do to you? <laughs> so I, I mentioned it's great to, uh, you know, have a really good partner in this and uh, working with my dad. I, I think we've, uh, you know, that, that that's part of, I think, what what enabled us, right? We, we kind of lean on each other to to get through that uh, a little bit. But the other thing is that my, my dad is trained in a, in a field called TRIZ. It stands, uh, it's a Russian acronym. It stands for Theory of Inventive Problem Solving. And what he would do, he, his job before Liquid Piston, before starting the company, he was an innovation consultant. And he would come into a, a company and help get their team unstuck. Doesn't matter what the challenge is, doesn't matter if he had any knowledge in, in that field. Uh, he, he would help the, help them get unstuck by applying a very systematic way of solving problems. So that's that's really been our core approach. We we just solve the problems. And if I had a dollar for every time somebody told me that it's not going to work or that I'm crazy, I would be rich by now. My you know, <laughs> I could retire. Um, but ultimately, uh, we were stubborn. We didn't know what we didn't know. My, my father and I, neither of us have an engine background. And every engine person, you know, they're, they're, they're trained. Uh, it, it's 150-year history. There's textbooks. There's history there. They're, they're, they're trained to, to, to go through this in a certain way. And we are just so against the grain. And the only reason we could do that is because we didn't have any of that training, which only facilitates them to say, the guys, you're crazy. You're not even engine people. You know, how, how could you do this? But, so, but, but Alec, you are so much of a contrarian that it actually begs the question. It begs a lot of questions in my mind, uh, or good questions. But I mean, 
surely you must have cro- this must have crossed your mind. I have an education in neuroscience, robotics, and AI. And I can't think of a better triad of technologies to be involved with at the level that you have it. Did it ever cross your mind that you could pick any of those areas or combine just a couple of them? I mean, there's this notion now of the T-shaped or even the pie-shaped expert, but you are actually a, I think they call it the comb-shaped expert. So someone who is really deep in three emerging, exciting technologies. Some of those people might say, you could pick any of those technologies and not only would you be rich now, but you could actually make path-breaking changes just because of integrating those three. Does that ever cross your mind that you are working on engines, but, and, and maybe this is a second stage of what you're thinking, but is there a way, and, and I'm really just making up this question, but is there a way to combine much more of your background with the engine space or are these just completely separate endeavors and then you know as you're explaining this uh you know we can get into some of the early client scenarios that you've been telling me about which i think are very very fascinating yeah uh i mean modeling and optimization is a very useful skill in in a variety of industries so you know you're you're correct i i could have taken a very different path um you know, I, I got excited uh, by working uh, on this uh, project with my father. It, it really started as a project. Uh, I was doing my PhD at MIT in robotics and artificial intelligence, and uh, every every step of the way, you know, it, it just got a little bit more exciting, and and it drew me in. Um, and uh, it, it's been an extremely hard journey. If somebody told me back in two thousand three what I was getting into. I might have changed have path. Yeah. I might have back then, you know, but, um, at every, you know, hindsight is always 2020, but at every stage where I was, I, I, I just saw the future potential of what we're doing, the importance of what we're doing. We, we haven't even talked about the, the national security implications uh, of what we're doing. I mean, it, it's, it's an enormous potential impact that we could have if we are successful in, in this. Um, you know, neuroscience me, is challenging um, because there, there's there's tens, hundreds of thousands of people working on it, and each person is is doing their their little their little thing. But it's very hard to make a huge impact on the field. Here, I, I think my dad and I, I, I think we're going to make a huge impact on power and energy. Which, I mean, that, that that's extremely exciting to me. I mean, there's there's nothing bigger than 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 power and energy. So tell me now. Let's you know we've talked about really for me at least, complicated things around engines, which is not a, a, a question I, I you know, think about on an everyday basis, but some of the clients that are experimenting with your engine, because it's actually now out there, right? You were telling me about the military application. So, I mean, the howitzer are gone. I've actually used one. Um, they are complicated for, for a lot of different reasons because they use a lot of energy. And, and you told me they, they actually typically, they, you know, use diesel generators. And, you know, the, that gun is just an example of many, many other military use cases where you're mobile and you're in the field and you don't have the grid. Right. Tell me, what are they currently doing to deal with that? And what is it that you can contribute in, in right. this picture? So a number of things that, that we need to understand about the, the, the U.S. military. First of all, we are the single largest consumer of oil on the planet. That the U.S. DOD consumes more ener- more more uh, fuel than, than anybody else as a single kind of buyer of, of fuel. Uh, the other thing to understand is ab- about half of our casualties in Iraq and Afghanistan were supporting uh, fuel and water convoys lo- lo- logistics, so pushing fuel to the front line. Uh, first of all, when, when you look at the cost of it, it, it can, it can approach up to $400 per gallon in certain circumstances. If you have to yeah. r- really push uh, fuel to, to where it's not available and it's measured not just in dollars, but quite literally in, in lives. Well, uh, so I, that, it would seem to be a dangerous thing. I mean, it kind of defies logic to run around the battlefield with uh, a fuel on your back, right? I mean, that's. 
And if you're ISIS and you know that you can't attack the entire, you know, U.S. Uh, de- defense industry, guess what? You will attack. You will attack the the the, the convoys that are carrying the, the blood. Right. The, the the fuel is the blood of the army, and, and everything requires power. When you have a camp, you need power to run the camp. When you have a vehicle that that that's somewhere a ground vehicle, it needs power. Uh, yeah, so these have, idling truck engines, that doesn't sound to me too environmentally friendly in and of itself either. Uh, a, a tank spends 99% of its time idling. Literally, most of the time, they're just sitting there and, and they're burning about one to two gallons of fuel per hour, doing nothing, just keeping the engine going and, and maybe providing a little bit of uh, cabin comfort in, inside of the vehicle and maybe a little electricity to run some of the computer diagnostics. But uh, when, when you idle an engine, to siphon, you know, a few kilowatts of power from a thousand horsepower engine, you're running at at one percent fuel efficiency. It's an extreme. What exactly cost. is your rotary engine doing then in this picture? So, in, in any of these cases, we can uh, okay. Well, let, let's back up a little bit. When you need power for uh, for a, a camp, for example, our engine can be configured as a genset, right? So you have a high-speed rotary engine, um, and you couple it with a electric, electrical motor that runs in reverse, and you get a generator. Uh, basically, our system is 10 times smaller and lighter than what they use today. A 30-kilowatt generator for the Army, standard military issue that's used for all the operating bases, it weighs 2,300 pounds. It's so big and heavy that it, it's installed into a trailer uh, by default, so that a truck can move it. It, it needs a truck. Um, in our in our gen set, literally two guys can move it around potentially, right? So um, it, it's an order of magnitude difference. Now you think about the logistics. Okay, so so you need to get the generator to the forward operating base, right? How how do you get your generator to Afghanistan? You got to yeah. fly them. Well, what's the impact if if your gen set is ten times smaller? You can pack a whole lot more and deploy much more quickly. So you have now capability and, and reduced logistical burdens. And then if the engine is operating with more efficiency, you need less fuel, less fuel convoys. All, all these things just kind of a- a- add up. Um, and, and that's just for you know mobile electric power. But then you have the vehicle side of things where the army uses a lot of vehicles. We transport a lot of stuff. There's airplanes, there's cars, there's UAVs. Um, on, on Tell me about the UAVs for a second. So UAV stands for unmanned uh, aerial vehicle, Correct. and uh, I, I guess that is a robotic use case uh, where you are applying your skills. So tell us, yeah. what is it that your engine can do on a UAV platform? Yeah. So the the big challenge that the military has is they would like everything to operate on a single fuel source. They they don't want to carry multiple different convoys of different types of fuel uh, to the front line. And most of their fuel is jet fuel, right? We're supporting the, the Air Force. Uh, and, and so they, they want everything to run on jet fuel. And also, it's, it's a lot safer fuel compared to gasoline. You, you can shoot a diesel fuel tank and nothing will happen uh, except for having a hole in the tank. Whereas if you shoot a gasoline gas tank, it, it, it'll explode. So um, it, it's a safety issue and it's a logistics issue. They want everything to run on diesel. The problem is that diesel engines are significantly bigger and heavier than gasoline engines. And for anything that flies, UAVs, uh, helicopters, uh, th- th- these things are very sensitive to weight. And so what they do today, they, they have to make sacrifices. The, the, uh, the Shadow UAV is the the most widely deployed army uh, UAV platform. It's used for uh, surveillance purposes. Uh, it actually uses, ironically, it uses a rotary engine to power that that system. They yeah. use the rotary because it has the power to weight that they need uh, to fly, uh, but it's a gasoline engine, and now they have to carry multiple fuels. And it, as we discussed before, it suffers from terrible fuel economy, which means that, that they can only go so far on their on their systems. So for us, if we could magically take an, an engine and reduce its size and weight, and also increase its efficiency by uh, by a lot, what that means for the army is it's a game changer, right? They can carry more equipment, they can go further and longer. Um, it, it, it's it's just a game changer for them. 
Uh, what is the status of these uh, test deployments that you have uh, for, for these various use cases? Is, is your engine actually out there in the field right now being tested? We, we have a couple of uh, prototypes, and uh, the purpose of our prototypes was to demonstrate the breadth of the technology. So our technology is scalable, uh, very much like a piston engine where, where you can you can change the size and, and, and uh, displacement of each piston. Then you can add more, more pistons. Uh, you can configure it in all sorts of different ways. So we have two primary demonstrators that we developed uh, in, 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 in the lab. The first is called the X-Mini. It's a five horsepower engine. It's small. Um, I actually have it here on my desk. Never leave home without it. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, so that, that's our most advanced prototype. Um, it it's a, has a technology readiness level of six, which means that it, it can start to be applied in applications. And uh, working with the Army, we've demonstrated it on the howitzer as a the power readiness supply. level. Is you're referring to the NASA, the NASA levels, of the NASA DoD, readiness. yeah, technology yeah. readiness levels, uh, which yeah. kind of describes the maturity of a technology. Uh, yeah, I'm TR familiar with it. TRL eight means that it's it's fielded, uh, and TRL six is basically the transition point where the technology is mature enough that it, it, you can start to. Uh, Start, start to work it into, into your systems. Yeah, start to deploy. It's a little bit more than the prototype stage. Got it. Right. And so, so, we, so tell me a little bit about what you envision with, with, with your company. So I know that uh, as a matter of historical record, in January this year, Liquid Piston, you, you raised uh, exactly $1.07 million in only nine hours and 22 minutes from uh, <laughs> 1,963 investors. So two questions. Yes. How did you do that? And yep. to why this highly specific amount? Uh, so the, the, uh, there's a new kind of um, uh, regulation that the SEC allows companies now to basically sell stock on the internet. So it's, it's not really going public, but you're now able as a startup for the first time, you, you can solicit investors online. And those rules went into effect in 2016 as part of the Jobs Act. Um, it, it's kind of a game changer for small companies. And the, the idea is to democratize uh, the fundraising process. R rather than turning to a handful of VCs that have all the power, uh, now you can say, okay, you know, there, there's markets for this stuff. And the market can decide what's a good investment and, and what's not. Now, the SEC... <coughs> You know, it's kind of starting slowly, but they put a a, a strict limit, which in 2016 was a million dollars, and now with inflation, it became 1.07 million. So that that's why the funky number. Um, but that that's the legal limit of what you're allowed to raise. And we we launched this uh, crowdfunding effort. Uh, it's it's called equity crowdfunding um, on a platform called Start Engine. Uh, we, we launched this on January 3rd and in, in nine hours, we oversubscribed, um, you know, to our knowledge, it was the fastest regulation CF fundraise in history. The other neat thing about it, you're, you're not allowed to, uh, talk about it or, uh, do any kind of marketing ahead of time. So right. it, it's not like I had a bank of people that were waiting to, to do this. It, it, it all just kind of happened. And a, as it was happening, People saw it and they, they were just kind of, they, they invested once and then they're like, well, this is going to sell out like immediately. So they, they came back and invested again and again. I've, I have people that invested two or three or four times in, in, you know, in the single day. And then I got emails from probably a thousand people just saying, Hey, Alec, we, you know, we, we wanted to get in on this and, and, uh, nobody told us about this. I'm like, I couldn't say anything about it. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm going to be careful just because there are some, uh, fine, there's fine print on, on all of these rules. Uh, so, yeah. you know, let's not discuss potential things here, uh, really, but would you say that this experience was positive? Did you, were you surprised? By well, well, one by the response, but by the, by the way that it works smooth. At least you know, uh, once it was, I, I'm sure it was a little finicky to to sort of to get it going. But how was your feeling around this this specific type of of fundraising? Did, would you say that it was an interesting process, or 
So, you know, we, we have a long history. I've actually given a seminar at MIT about uh, fundraising, and I, I, I can talk about it for hours if you want me to. <laughs> uh, we've had venture capital investment. We've had angel investment. We've had government uh, investment, you know, $9 million in, in contracts with DARPA and the Army. We, we, we've raised uh, $20, $24 million now in, in private uh, m- money uh, from from VCs and angel investors, and, and we've done the crowdfunding uh, thing. Um, there is a lot of uh, concern about crowdfunding, especially from the VCs, because it is so new. You know, and, and dealing with so many investors, you mentioned thousands of investors. Um, you know, we, we thought it, it it might be very burdensome. Um, we thought it might be complicated, but it uh, it. it, it for certain companies, I think it's a very good strategy, a very good fit. It it helps. Um, it honestly ha- having a couple thousand people that are now my uh, marketing team, right? If you think about it, that yes. Way too. <laughs> See, that's the interesting. That's actually kind of what I wanted to get at because people are saying. People, some people say it's so complicated because now you have all these opinions because you know they think about it. Think of it as, you know, if I had more than 10 angel investors, I mean, what a nightmare, right? Because every angel, they invest, you know, 50,000 or 20,000 of their money and they're now they suddenly think they own you. They want to get exactly. on your calendar. They have all this advice and, you know, nothing bad about angels, but, you know, let's just assume you had 20 of those and now you, you know, have 200 of those and, and now you have a thousand of those. That obviously can't be the mindset. <clears throat> but on the other hand, if you think about the public markets, I mean, you buy a share if I own, uh, you know, a share of, of GM, I don't feel like I have the right to just, I'm not going to call up an executive at GM and say, Hey, I'm a shareholder. It's not like being an alum at a, at a university where they have to answer your, your, your call or email. So, so it it doesn't, what is that identity you get when you invest? I mean, what, what kind of contact have you had with these people? Uh, You're, you're, you hit it right on the head. I I was very concerned about that because angel investors are, are, I love them. Thank you. Angels. No, we we all love them. And that's a whole other discussion. They are angels. But they are high maintenance. They, they ask a lot of questions. They, they do a lot of diligence. You know, here we worked with a platform that did, that did a lot of the diligence that laid everything out in, in, in one way that that's fair. Uh, People can come in and ask questions, and the questions are public, and we respond publicly, and everybody can see that. Um, you know, I, I send uh, quarterly updates uh, to, to the investors, and then we, we for for compliance, that there, there are certain uh, updates we have to send around. I, I think once a year. Um, yep. But overall, the the level of engagement, you know, uh, people will, are very encouraging, um, but they they don't tend to d- demand a lot of uh, time. Um, so that, that has been good. And, and, um, we've also been very clear with our investors, like, Hey guys, we have thousands of, of, of investors. We, we love every single one of you. You're the reason we're, we're here. Uh, but if, if I spent, you know, four hours of my day with each one of you, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to do anything else that, that you're, that you're supporting us to do. Right. So I think they, I think people get it. And, uh, I, I'm, I'm very pleasantly surprised by, by how smooth uh, the, the entire process uh, is. And uh, the, the, the platform helps a lot with that. Um, so yeah, that, it's been great. Got it. Got it. Let's, uh, I mean, this, this conversation is just so exciting to me. Let's move to the future of mobility uh, and looking a little bit beyond your individual company now for a second in the near future, which for me is the next five to seven years. How does yeah. the hybrid mobility landscape look like? And we have kind of touched upon it. Um, we talked about Mazda and their hybrid plans. Um, you mentioned fuel cells and the whole hydrogen, uh, space, which has been around actually surprisingly also since the 1930s. Yeah. Number one is why do all these innovations in this hybrid mobility space take so long? Because I'm used to, I mean, we're all used to an iPhone every year or so. And this space just has a completely different timeline. So when we think about the future, uh, do we, is, is five to seven years not really enough to, to make a bit of a difference? Or are we also moving into a different cycle in this hybrid space right now where, where things could happen faster? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the software fields and electronics fields, that they can move extremely quickly. Uh, on the engine side, on propulsion, on 
things like urban air mobility. You know, I, I read this morning that the the estimate to produce a certified vehicle for urban air mobility it, it'll require a, a thousand engineers working for five to seven years to produce a uh, a fully certified vehicle. So just just think about the magnitude of that for a moment. And and with engines, it it takes about five to seven years to launch a new engine. And when 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 we talk about a new engine. We're, we're typically talking about a piston engine, which is a modification of something that's that's older. You're, you're, you're tweaking. So the, the automotive uh, world will typically spend about a billion dollars putting out a, a new engine platform. Um, in the non-automotive world, you know the, the number is more like one to two hundred million dollars for for a new uh, commercial launch uh, of an engine. So it, it's a big deal. It, it takes a lot of time, and, and people don't appreciate all of the complexity that's involved here um you, you need to you need to make sure that your your production lines are producing things reliably that every engine operates in the same way you got to take your engine into all sorts of weird operating spaces you know because when's the last time that that, that you had an engine failure in, in your car you, you probably cannot remember it since you know the the for, 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 for at least a few decades, right? No, um, no, for sure. I mean, I, I remember a friend of mine uh, had an engine failure, but they had seen the oil light forever and ever and ever. He was using his parents' car and he had refused to do anything about it. He was just like, hey, it's not my problem until it, yeah. of course, became his problem and the car was bust, right? Yeah, it, it, was, the, it was over. The, the days of that being common where, where your engine overheats and you got to pull over and, and you know, that th- those days are like long right. gone, right? So right. people have a higher expectation now from their engines and it just means that they need to be so well refined and, and that takes a, a long time. Now, and it's not like a Tesla where you can run a software update. Uh, you, you well coming back to a little bit to my background. I mean, th- th- there there is quite a bit we can do on controls in engines, and one day I, I hope that you know I, I'm I'm working right now on introducing the first engine platform, but um, it, it's going to be a point where uh, controls are, are going to be critical for the engine as well, and the the engine world is is way behind. The, the, the rest That's of the what I was on. trying to dig yeah. for is, you know, one, I, I understand you're spending a lot of energy just building the platform, having people believe that there should be a new platform. Yeah. W- once this platform is getting a little more established, what are, um, with your or other technologies, what are the potentials for control systems with these new technologies? Uh, yeah, so just, just and then couldn't that just, I mean, just from a naive perspective, it would seem to me that the moment you you are able to cleverly match some sort of sensor technology and, and, and AI on top of these engine-based uh, systems, wouldn't you then uh, achieve enormous efficiencies and, uh, and, you know, the moment you were able to actually work at that level? Yes, absolutely. Um, and there, there's at least two examples that I can think of right off the bat. The, the first is uh, we're doing something called uh, skip fire control. And if you look at a diesel engine, if you want to have less power, you inject less fuel. So you're adding less heat to each cycle. Uh, if you look at the efficiency curve, as you, as you have less and less power, the efficiency drops to zero. So that, that's just a thermodynamic thing. Uh, the other way to do this, and that's what we are advocating, and we've, we've patented this, because we have no oscillating mass, everything in our engine is a purely rotational uh, system. Every time we inject fuel, we can inject the optimal amount. You, you can run the engine basically full load at, at high power every time you inject. The way you modulate power is digitally. You, you don't inject fuel every time around. So um, that that that's thermodynamically much more fuel efficient. And you know, in, in a car, think about how often do you drive with your foot all the way down uh, in in full power, right? The, the the problem yeah. with the car and the reason why you know people will 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 quote all sorts of the efficiency numbers. A combustion engine can be forty percent fuel efficient, but your yeah. car is fifteen to twenty percent fuel efficient. Why the discrepancy? The reason is you you almost never drive your car in the sweet spot of the engine where it's most efficient. You you drive your car way away from the sweet spot, and that yep. comes back to the hybrid question. With hybrid, you can now run your engine at its sweet spot and uh, use the electric part 
which is generally kind of m- more efficient all, all around. So you, you, you kind of, you're able to combine the best of, of both worlds. Uh, but, but with a fuel cell, particularly there, there were, there are some problems there, right? So one is the infrastructure issue because, uh, you know, similar to introducing a new engine of any kind, they, they are dependent on refueling stations. And if you look at, uh, London, they have 16 available, uh, stations in California. I believe they have 39 with some others under development. And, and there's some, also on the East coast, there's a little pocket of these refueling stations and tests. Um, However, it has come as a technology, hydrogen and fuel cells have come farther on forklifts and kind of in the commercial market than in the personal uh, vehicle space. Yet, uh, you know, and there are a lot of people saying this is, this is the, true, the, the true future. Elon Musk says the hydrogen car technology is mind-bogglingly stupid and calls it fuel cells. What's your comment to that? <laughs> so, uh, again, th- there's potential misnomers, uh, very much like the MPGE discussion where they only talk about electrons leaving the battery and they neglect everything about how, how the battery is produced and how the electron got there. With, with fuel cells, you, you got to ask the same question. How do you get the hydrogen? You're, yes, your vehicle may be zero emission because hydrogen and oxygen produce water as the output. And that's wonderful. Water is your emission. Uh, that, that, that's great. But how did you get the hydrogen and, and how did you get it into the vehicle? And the, the, the easiest way to get your hydrogen is, is, you know, through reforming methane or, or something else. And that immediately produces, uh, carbon dioxide. So that now again, you've just, you've just moved the problem somewhere else. Um, hydrogen has other, other potential issues. You know, it, it's very low density. Um, so you, you, you don't get a lot of, uh, energy storage from it. Um, people are, are working through that and, and, and um, you know, they're, they're resolving that. Um, but as an aside, our, our engine would also be compatible with hydrogen. Um, yep. It's a little known fact that, that rotaries are very, uh, you know, it, it's hard to run hydrogen in a piston engine because uh, piston engines have hot spots and yeah. they, they'll ignite the hydrogen. The rotary tends to be more thermally kind of similar, that there's no real hot spots that serve as ignition sources. And, and we found the same thing. We, we can get higher compression ratios than typical piston engines. Um, so we're, we're, we're able to run, I haven't done it yet, but, but we should be able to run on, on hydrogen as well. But you're right. The, the infrastructure is difficult. And with all of this, you need to consider the, the overall holistic uh, uh, impact, right? And, and something that we didn't talk about was the infrastructure requirements also for going electric. Uh, yeah. If you just consider what a gas station does, um, you know, the, the, the average uh, fuel pump puts out 13 gallons per minute of fuel. With the amount of energy content there and, and you know, power equals energy divided by time, that equates to 26 megawatts. Every single fuel pump puts out 26 megawatts. So think about a busy intersection that has, you know, two or three or four gas stations with, you know, each with a dozen uh, fuel pumps. You need to replace that intersection of gas stations. You would need to replace it with a nuclear power plant. Same thing with urban air mobility. We're talking about electric vehicles that go from rooftop to rooftop. How do you get the energy back uh, and shuttle it up the uh, up the side of a building and, and get it into the aircraft? You, you need a, you need a power plant for 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 each of these. Alec, all of these issues are complicated. My last question to you is: How do you stay at the top of your game? And one in, one thing is how how do you do it? But for my listeners, uh, some of whom are extremely uh, you know well versed in technology, others maybe less so. What are the tools? What are the publications? Who are the influencers you trust? What, what institutions do you go to? What, which startups would you recommend watching apart from yours? How, how do you stay at the top of your game in such a complicated field, which seems slow moving, but then suddenly has these breakthroughs, which we'll have to watch for? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm going to recommend a single news source because I, I just tend to read as much as I can uh, in, in all sorts of uh, news sources. But one of the cool things about running a startup company is I'm constantly talking to people. I'm on the phone 
two thirds of my day with, you know, a, a dozen different people and people are, I have 2000 investors, as you mentioned, they're sending me articles every now and then, Hey, did you see this? <laughs> um, so I, I get, I get a lot of different news sources um, and, and a lot of different points of information. So I, I, I'm just, I guess I'm in the thick of it, but, um, uh, but for yeah. others, I mean, is it, is it on the private side? Is it on the school and, uh, you know, academic side that you, you would get the most, uh, or, I mean, are there specialty sources for, uh, for kind of mobility information that, that are worth subscribing to newsletters, anything? I mean, no, no seems to me to, that Google is schools, just so fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if you're going to learn this stuff in, in, in school. Um, you know, but, but having said that at MIT, I remember, you know, in, in our lab, we had, uh, something like 15 people in the lab. And I think 13 of us, uh, had a startup company that we were working on, uh, at the side. So MIT is a special place. And, and I think if you're, if you're in the startup world, I, I think you will naturally just to, to, to do what you're doing. I think you have to stay on top of everything. Um, but you know th th there are seminars everywhere. Um, okay, so I, I I made fun of schools as not being a good source. Uh, in, in classes, you're learning from textbooks, which tend to not be the absolute most up to date. But th there's always guest speakers that come around. There's always seminars, and, and those are great um, sources. Um, you know, we, we participate in a lot of uh, kind of these like military competitions. Right, right now, we're a finalist in the Army X Tech Search. And that, that's great that we're finalists, but part of that, you know, they, they have these programs where they just bring lots of people together and, and share the problems and share the state of the art. And I'm, I'm hearing what the other startups are doing. So, um, you know, conferences are a great way to, to stay uh, engaged and every field will have its own its own good, good news sources. So I, I don't know if I have a great answer for you on that. No. Um, I mean, the world is complicated. I will tell you this, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation and I thank you for letting it go over what we had initially talked about. I was just so fascinated to hear how you reason around these very complicated things and best of luck to you. And uh, thank you so much for your time, Alan. John, thank you. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure. Uh, pleasure. Uh, and and uh, yeah, um, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here with you today. You have just listened to episode 20 of the Futurist podcast with host Trun Arne Unheim, futurist and author. The topic was the future of engines. Our guest was Alec Skolnik, president and co-founder of Liquid Piston. We talked about engines and how they can power robots, vehicles and drones. Our guest has made the bold choice of making a new engine, which hasn't been attempted since 1954, instead of just capitalizing on his gold-plated education education in AI, robotics, and neuroscience in the most obvious way. My takeaway is that even though engines powered by anything but electricity seem a bit outdated in today's environment, the future is a hybrid scenario with a mix of engines with different capabilities contributing to optimizing our desired mobility. By giving the rotary engine an overhaul, liquid piston might take us even faster into a future where the myriad of engines and machines let us venture farther faster and with more flexibility than today's technologies allow. What an exciting prospect that in this age of big conglomerates in the automotive sector, a father-son business might one day power the vehicles you see all around you. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, subscribe at futurize.co or in your preferred podcast player and rate us with five stars. Futurize, preparing you to deal with disruption.